Experts say a new wound found on whale carcass in Sai Kung was likely caused by boat propellers. Rescue and relief work underway in flooded areas around Beijing. And Myanmar's military-controlled government reduces the prison sentence of Aung San Suu Kyi and extends the country's state of emergency. Hello and welcome to TVB News. The discovery of the dead whale in waters off Shelter Island, Sai Kung, has sparked concerns about Hong Kong's marine wildlife protection efforts. The Ocean Park Conservation Fund, responsible for post-mortem analyses on the whale, said a new wound found on the mammal was likely caused by boat propellers. Jackie Lin with more. Staff at the Ocean Park Conservation Fund and veterinary experts continue to perform an autopsy on the whale next to the west end of the High Island Reservoir. Tissue specimens from its internal organs and blood samples have been collected. The Ocean Park Conservation Fund said preliminary sampling shows the marine mammal was a juvenile brutus whale. But further analyses are needed to ascertain its age. No ocean trash and foreign objects were found in its stomach. Some of them we need to send over uh, to other country overseas and laboratory, uh, including uh, the DNA analysis, as well as uh, some of the samples uh, from the organs. We want to have more in-depth analysis that may take weeks uh, for the results to be back. The Ocean Park Conservation Fund added most fatalities for stranded whales involve boats, sickness or infection, as well as entanglement and fishing gear. Meanwhile, conservation groups slammed the government for not doing its utmost to prevent the whale's tragic fate. When the whale was first spotted in waters off Sai Kung in mid-July, the Hong Kong Dolphin Conservation Society had proposed the SR government follow Shenzhen's precedent by setting up a restricted zone when a stray whale entered its waters in 2021. As Chairman Tyson Chang said, Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department turned down the proposal after a day. Secretary for Environment and Ecology Jia Chin Wen said they will review the current laws. If uh, AFCD well, can have more well, uh, immediate power well, uh, to manage, say for example, well, uh, those people to come to uh, observe the whale, uh, uh, that sort of thing, well, they, they may have a uh, and, but they may also require some other enforcement power as well to help them. Yeah, and therefore, we will review all those well together. Zai added the government had appealed to the public not to take boat trips to observe the whale, and patrols have been stepped up at the time. The government is working to develop a set of protocols to speed up the action needed to protect marine wildlife. Jackie Lin, TVB News. Total Hong Kong retail sales in June saw a 19.6 percent increase year on year, reaching around $33 billion. The government said the rise was due to increased inbound tourism and positive consumption sentiment. According to the Census and Statistics Department, the value of sales of jewelry and watches jumped 64 percent. Compared to June 2022, the value of sales of supermarket goods decreased by 3.5 percent. Authorities believe the outlook for retail sales is positive as more tourists are expected to visit Hong Kong in the future, giving a boost to the city's economic recovery. However, the Hong Kong Retail Management Association said the latest figures show the market has not fully recovered as far as local consumers are concerned. Beijing and nearby cities continued relief efforts after torrential rain and severe floods inundated neighborhoods, damaged infrastructure and claimed at least 20 lives. President Xi Jinping has instructed authorities to do their best in rescue efforts. So far, more than 120,000 have been evacuated from flood-devastated regions. Search and rescue work is underway for those missing or trapped. Jackie Lin with more. In Beijing, the downpours appear to have tapered off in the morning, but flood water yet to have abated, especially around low-lying areas. Washed-up debris and dredged-up sludge made it hard for commuters to traverse. 
Authorities work to clean up the mess. Helicopters deployed to by the People's Liberation Army to drop off emergency supplies to flood-devastated regions. Starting Saturday night, Beijing had been lashed by torrential rain, with Mentogo and Fangshan districts in the city suburbs being the hardest hit. The cumulative precipitation until Tuesday morning in Mentogo surpassed 700 millimeters. Relentless downpour swelled rivers, leading to severe flash floods. Flood control efforts have been undertaken by some 2,000 armed officers in Fangshan district. A bridge collapsed amid the torrent. According to local media reports, five cars were parked on the bridge, but no one was inside the vehicle. Authorities reminded that even when the downpours have weakened, citizens in flood-prone regions should stay away from rivers and waterways. Jacqueline, TVB News. A spokesperson for the National Unity Government, an underground group that calls itself the country's legitimate government, said the extension of emergency rule was expected. The spokesperson claimed that's because the military government has not been able to annihilate pro-democracy forces. Meanwhile, Myanmar state media reported the military-led government has reduced the prison sentences of ousted leader Aung San Suu Kyi in a clemency connected to a religious ceremony. Suu Kyi is serving 33 years imprisonment after being convicted of 19 charges. Rights groups and her supporters say these were attempts to discredit her and legitimize the army takeover while preventing her return to politics. Former President Win Myint also had his sentence reduced as part of the clemency granted more than 7,000 prisoners. Dunwell, TV News. An Afghan branch of the Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for suicide bombing in Pakistan on Sunday. The attack left more than 50 people dead and nearly 200 others injured at a pro-Taliban party's election rally. Islamic State in Khorasan province made the claim in a statement posted on its website. It said the attacker detonated an explosive vest. It added the bombing was part of the group's continuing war against forms of democracy it deems to be against Islam. The attack in the northwestern town of Bajur was one of the worst in the region in recent years. Officials have revised the death toll to at least 56 and said the number could rise. Paris is not saying what comes next, but it will start evacuating its citizens out of the country from today. It told them to carry no more than a small bag. French Foreign Minister Catherine Colonna said Monday that accusations that France shot at the crowd protesting in front of its embassy has all the usual ingredients of destabilization the Russian African way. Regional bloc ECOWAS has imposed sanctions and said it could authorize force to reinstate Bazoum. But all the juntas of Burkina Faso, Mali and Guinea all voiced support for the coup leaders Monday. Matthew Bray, TVB News. Still ahead, Russia launches a new attack on the Ukrainian president's hometown. UNESCO experts recommend that Venice be added to the list of World Heritage Sites in Danger. And at Hangzhou Zoo, a bear that attracts over 20,000 visitors daily. Welcome back. Russia fired ballistic missiles at the hometown of Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, killing six people, while at the same time defending its capital from drone attacks. Russia's defense minister, meanwhile, says Ukraine's counteroffensive has failed and it's only a matter of time before Kyiv's Western allies tire of providing support. Nazvi Karim has more. As Russia's top military leaders gathered for a meeting, Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu took a slightly mocking tone on Ukraine's much vaunted counteroffensive. The so called counteroffensive, he said, has failed, with Ukraine resorting to terrorist attacks on cities and towns in Russia. Kyiv's counteroffensive to reclaim territory from Russia in the east and south has been going on for several weeks, and progress has been slow. Shoigu and later Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov questioned how long Ukraine's Western allies were willing to keep sending tens of billions of dollars worth of weaponry for a cause that has so far yielded minimal gains. The terrorist attacks Shoigu mentioned refer to the latest drone strikes on Moscow on Tuesday, though Kiev is yet to claim responsibility. 
Russia says anti-aircraft units downed two drones in the suburbs, but a third drone stuck the Moskva city building in the business district, which had been damaged days earlier in a similar drone attack. Russia also stepped up strikes on Ukraine, firing ballistic missiles at the central city of Kriviria, the hometown of Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. Ukraine says six people were killed and 75 wounded as the missiles destroyed at least five floors of an apartment building. It said the dead included a 10-year-old and her mother. Ukraine reportedly shelled areas in Donetsk and Zaporizhia with five deaths in total. Meanwhile, the United States says it supports a Ukraine peace summit scheduled to be held in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia this week. Around 30 countries are invited with the exception of Russia, though some nations insist Moscow is represented in some way. We have long said um, that it is important that Ukraine be in the driver's seat when it comes to any potential diplomatic resolution uh, to this war. Um, it's important that countries that have not yet heard directly from Ukraine hear from Ukraine. So we are gratified that there will be countries that are attending this summit to um, uh, talk directly with Ukraine. The Kremlin spokesman said Moscow would monitor discussions during the summit, even if it is not invited. Nazvi Karim, TVB News. A Russian opposition politician, Vladimir Karamurza, has lost an appeal against a 25-year prison sentence. Karamurza was imprisoned in April for alleged treason and spreading disinformation about Russia's war in Ukraine. He's one of the few opposition figures who stayed in Russia and spoke out against the Kremlin's invasion of its neighbor. He was detained two months after the war started and after CNN broadcast an interview with him in which he stated Russia was run by a regime of murderers. Karamurza was a close aide to former opposition leader Boris Nemtsov, who was shot dead in central Moscow in 2015. UNESCO experts have recommended that Venice and its lagoon be added to its list of World Heritage Sites in Danger. UNESCO said Italy is not doing enough to protect the city from the impact of climate change and mass tourism. The agency hopes to see greater dedication and mobilization of local and national stakeholders to address long-standing issues. A spokesperson for the Venice municipality said the city will carefully read the proposed decision and discuss it with the government. Venice has been struggling with mass tourism for years. On a single day during the 2019 carnival, some 193,000 people squeezed into its historic center. A committee of 21 UNESCO member states will review more than 200 sites and decide which to add to the danger list at a September meeting in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. The large glowing X sign that was put on top of the former Twitter building in San Francisco has been taken down following complaints. Residents and neighbors in the Market Street area had been angered by the intrusive lights and possible structural safety issues. Ex-owner Elon Musk had the sign installed after he rebranded the social media platform. After inspection by city authorities, the structure was dismantled. The property owner will face fees for the unpermitted installation. Musk has said X will stay in San Francisco, despite the city being in what he termed a doom spiral. Chief Executive John Lee will deliver his second policy address in October, and he has started consultation sessions. His first meeting was with local members of the National People's Congress and the Chinese, National, and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. As Mimo Singai reports, more than 30 consultation sessions will be held. This morning, 17 Hong Kong deputies to the National People's Congress and four Hong Kong members of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference met with Chief Executive John Lee at the central government offices. This marked the first consultation session before Lee delivers his second policy address on October 25th. Participants were pleased about today's session, which was described as enthusiastic as everyone was eager to express his or her views. Some of them said they had expressed concern about the economy. We need to be more uh, integrated with the development of uh, uh, the mainland. Uh, 
uh, the GBA area is, a, I think, is a good opportunity for uh, all of the uh, uh, young people or the business uh, people in Hong Kong to uh, develop their their uh, business to uh, further uh, enlarge their market. Hong Kong has uh, been very much dependent on our financial market and our property sector. And of course, uh, our uh, government is pouring a lot of money into R&D research in various kinds of technology and so on and so forth. I would very much uh, hope to see uh, further elaborations of these uh, in the upcoming policy address. Nicholas Chan, a local MPC deputy, put his focus on the city's tourism, retail and food and beverage sectors as he proposed that the CE launch a Shop Hong Kong campaign to encourage tourists to buy locally manufactured products. John Lee then met with civil service organizations in the afternoon. Bonnie Lo, chairman of the Disciplined Services Consultative Council, hopes the authorities will pay more attention to civil servants' salary adjustments so as to retain talent in the public sector. The public can now contribute opinions to the upcoming policy address via different channels, such as visiting policy address website. Memos and I, TVB News. And if you're afraid of heights, now is the time to look away. A world record for slackline walking has been set in Qatar. The iconic Katara Towers in Lusail, Qatar, was the scene for the awe-inspiring feat, with Estonian daredevil John Ruse writing his name into the record books. Ruse, a three-time slackline world champion, competed the longest LED-lit single-building slackline walk at his first attempt. Battling high winds, he covered more than 150 meters between the Twin Towers. The Sparkline Walk was not only the longest on a single building, but also Roos's highest urban walk to date at an elevation of more than 185 meters, performed on a line that was just 2.5 centimeters wide. Ah, that was a fight. That's the news. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.